Welcome, Randy, with me. What an honor, Randy. Thank you for being here today. Thank you, Pastor Candace. Good morning, everybody. It's an honor to be here. And uh, I've got 30 minutes to fit in about 3,000 years of stuff. So, uh, so I'm going to talk like an auctioneer. Uh, no, but, uh, but there's, I was just telling Pastor Candace, I, I mean, just, I, I think I could do 45 minutes just unpacking her name in Acts 8. Uh, and and I, so if, if nobody has done that yet, I think we're, I'm going to plant the seeds as somebody will. I'm going to scratch the surface on that. But I, I, it, a lot has changed since, the, since when we scheduled for me to be here. When, when we bring pastors to Israel, we ask them to take a look at our website, kind of pop our hood and check our oil and make sure that we line up with what the Lord's put on their heart regarding Israel. And part of that is making sure that you don't feel uncomfortable being caught out in public with us and wearing our jersey and, and having us come and, and just kind of share, taking things a little deeper. And, and I appreciate the heart that this church has for Jesus. I appreciate the name of this church. I very much appreciate the mission field that you are in here in Utah, right in the heart of Utah. And, uh, and I just want to... I wanted to throw out something that many of you will have heard before, and some of you will have never heard it before, and some of you are not sure what I mean by it, and it'll take you a while to process it. But when you're walking with Jesus, it requires two legs. And one of those legs is your understanding and your grasp of Israel and God's plan. Uh, and so I can tell by the looks that they're like, hmm, just process that and you'll, and you'll see what I mean. And we're gonna, we're gonna unpack that in here as we go. And I uh, see, I don't have a confidence monitor here, but if we can go ahead and, and start that, uh, that would be great. So when we were originally gonna do this, it was an entirely different message. I was going to, I, I actually spoke at a church on October uh, 7th, and as I was driving from Cheyenne to Laramie, I was listening to the news and trying to bring myself up to speed on, on all the unimaginable, incomprehensible things that had happened and how am I going to speak about that in a relevant way in a church on a Sunday morning? Uh, thankfully, I was in a church that was already out the gate and down the road and, and had long been entrenched with CUFI, and, they, and, and so they had a really good grasp. But not, I can't presume that that's the case in every church, and I can't presume that that's the case with everybody that's in any church. I have to assume... I don't want to make a spectacle out of anybody, but is there anybody here that this, you're just visiting here for the first time? Just, this is not, you know, maybe this isn't your home church. It's okay to raise your hand. Okay, so, all right, all right, you brought it on yourself then. <laughs> had you had somebody raise their hand, then I would assume that you might be here because you're not getting a dial tone. You might be wrestling with some news and you're not sure how to navigate it. You might not see a light at the end of the tunnel. You know, you might be in a, in a, in a storm in your life that you're not sure how you're going to get out of. And you've seen some hope in other people. You've seen some joy in other people. You've seen stability and uh, an upward forward movement in these people that, that just talk about Jesus all the time. And they're always busy on Sunday mornings with their commitment at church. And you're just wondering if maybe that with something that could help you out of the pit that you're in. And God bless you if that's you. Uh, you know, uh, uh, and, and all of a sudden they come to church and what is this? I'm talking about a geopolitical Israel thing. That's not what I signed up for. Actually, I would encourage you that though we are going to have to talk about some edgy things because of what's going on in the world, the reality is, is that if you would just endeavor to reread your Bible without any commentary... To what does the book of God say about Israel? The very least that's going to happen to you is that you're going to be reminded or you're going to have the epiphany or you're going to have the revelation that the God in whom your faith rests doesn't just keep his promises, but he makes promises that require miracles to be fulfilled. And he does it through Israel. Let's do that next slide. The, the, what I was going to... What I, the message that I was going to do and and... And Jonathan kind of, you know, almost took away my punchline here when he was talking about, uh, about hope because the message that I was going to do was, you know, we do what's called Israel is, dot, 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 and we've got the attributes that Christians see when they understand Israel from what they read in the Bible, the attributes that Christians see when they take a look at Israel. It's biblical. It's truth. 
Pastor Candace will tell you, you can't stick a shovel any, in any acre in Israel without unearthing archaeological evidence, not just of a Jewish presence, but substantiating stories in the Bible, people in the Bible, places in the Bible, that just a couple of decades ago, scholars and scientific elite were saying, that's just a book of myth and fables. There never even was a figure called King David. And then, wow, what is this? Oh, it's the city of David. It, it takes more faith to be an atheist than it does to be a Christian. You don't need to go to Israel to substantiate your faith, but you can't help but having your faith substantiated when you go to Israel. But, but all of these attributes, truth and hope and light, resilience, family, like we see in Romans 11, we're grafted in, we're adopted in to the family of God through the mercies of Jesus Christ, as Paul explains in Romans 9, 10, and 11. But I was gonna camp on hope because I see a mirror reflection when you take a look at Genesis 20, and we're not going to do this message, but I'm going to give you a kind of a spoiler sneak peek of it just so you can appreciate what we're looking at because it plays a significant facet in what we are seeing unfolding in the Middle East and Israel that started on October 7th. What I was going to say, what I was going to teach on, I was going to open up Genesis 26 where we have Abraham's son Isaac. There, not only are you in the desert, there is a famine too. So, not, so that suggests that if, what few wells you've got are probably dry. And Isaac goes to the king of the Philistines, Abimelech. Do you mind if I redig my dad's wells? See what happens? Knock yourself out. And he goes and he does and he hits water. And his crops start to grow. And his herds start to grow. And his flocks start to thrive. And his tribe gets strong. And the Philistines get jealous and they say, get out of here. And he doesn't fight them and defend the well. He goes a little further east and he digs out another well. And everywhere he goes, it happens again and again until he gets all the way to Beersheba, where every, in the famine, he still hits water. And King Abimelech finally catches up with him and says, you know what? You clearly have the blessing of your God. I think it's a good idea for me to normalize relations with my Hebrew neighbors which is a foreshadow of the crux of the Abraham Accords. Just let's do a pro-con column. What's the downside of normalizing relations with this fire hose of technology of making contributions to the international community with all that she has to do with innovations? And every one of them has to do with either extending the days of life or enhancing the quality of life. You're in the desert, all of her neighbors are in a famine, and what is her number one accomplishment? Water technology. It was a big deal 4,000 years ago, and it's a big deal today. Not just water, I mean, she gets one-eighth the rainfall of the Navajo Nation, but she exports her agriculture. When I first went to Israel the first time, the guide was talking about the apartment that he had where you had to put coins in the meter to run the shower because water was so scarce. And today they brag, take the longest shower you want. We got all the water that you want because they are cutting edge technology and water reclamation, desalinization, water recycling, water generation out of thin air. And so that's the technology that had their Arab countries sitting down, stopping to write the seven figure checks for Israel's annihilation and to actually enter into discussions on how they could share that technology and nation after nation after nation was sitting down and Saudi Arabia was about to grab the end of the olive branch and join them. And there are scholars, there are Middle East analysts, there are experts in journalism that focus on the Middle East. You can't hardly switch on any news channel that's talking about this topic without somebody suggesting that this whole thing was triggered because Iran wanted to derail Saudi Arabia from entering the, the Abraham Accords. We'll take a look at that. If you knew that I was going to be here today, if you knew that this was going to be the message on a Sunday morning, you, some, most of you, I'm guessing, probably had in the back of your mind, because you know, we all have questions, especially about the war. But, but some of you in the back of your mind is like, good, maybe, maybe I'll learn something that I, tangible that I can do. Some of you want to know, what can I do? I'm in Salt Lake City, Utah, what can I do? 
But some of you, like, why should I even care about Israel? What does that have to do with me? I'm half a world away. First thing, you should care about Israel because God cares about Israel. It's biblical. Let's go, let's go ahead. Let, let's go to that next slide. We've already, you know, Pastor Jason's already talked about Psalm 122, and I and I will I will forego the 15 minutes that I would do on that. But Genesis 12 through you can't do, you cannot go to a message you can't pick, pick up a book you can't watch a documentary you can't go to a conference without somebody at some point dropping Genesis 12 3. And nine of the ten that quote it always leave off the third line. Everybody owes. I'll bless those that bless thee, and I'll curse thee that curse thee, and nine of them will leave off, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. I believe that you can, I mean, we can take a look at all the scriptures that are the chronicling of the manifestation of this promise. This is a, this is a prophecy. It is a promise. It's a warning, and it's a principle, like gravity. God doesn't do parlor tricks. This is not a lucky rabbit's foot or a four-leaf clover. I'm going to give, so I'm going to write a check, and I'm going to give, so I'm going to get. It isn't a transaction like that. You've got to genuinely want to give without any strings attached, and the Lord is going to give back to you in a way to grow your faith. I believe that it's a cousin to what we see in Malachi, where the Lord, the only place in your whole Bible where the Lord asks you to test him. What's he asking you to test him with? A little bit of what's already his in the first place. To give back to see if he doesn't touch it and grow it to grow your faith. And that's what he's doing with Genesis 12, 3. I'm going to examine this principle. I'm going to give you just a little hint, and hopefully somebody's going to take this little, you know, tiny seed and, and run with it. But I am going to talk about Candace in Acts 8. Here you have a eunuch from Ethiopia, he run, and Philip sees him, he's in a chariot. I'm not gonna, we're not going to talk about what happens there. We're going to talk about who, who he is, what he does, and why is he there. He's the head of Candace's, the queen of Ethiopia. He's the head of her treasury. Pretty high authority. What's he doing there? He's got, he's bringing a tribute, just like Sheba did 900 years earlier. What happened when, when Queen Sheba paid this tribute to God's chosen that 900 years later they still think it's important to do it? Something significant is my answer. Something very significant. 900 years later they're still bringing a tribute to honor God's chosen people? I think, I think it's absolutely amazing. And so, and, and I think it was, I believe it was Jonathan that mentioned about being chosen. There's a phenomenon, used to be filmed not very far from, from here, Goshen, uh, Utah. It used to be one of the sets for this phenomenon TV series. I have no idea where you land or care or think about the series. It doesn't matter to me. Some people hate it because of its artistic license. Some people love it because it's making people read the Bible to see, did that character even exist? doesn't matter to me where you land on it. The question is chosen for what? Chosen, and, and you'll find the answer in Isaiah 41 through 45. That's your homework assignment. Go home and reread Isaiah 41 through 45, and you will find, I have chosen Jacob, my servant Israel, to be my witness. I'm paraphrasing five chapters into one statement right now. I have chosen Jacob, Israel, my servant, to be my witness that I alone am God. That is what we are grafted into in Romans 11. So the, the questions that we're going to ask when we come in, not just why should I care, not just what can I do, but what happened on October 7th? Why did it happen? And what's going to happen? What happened? The Jews were attacked again. Why were they attacked? Because they're Jews was it because of the Abraham Accords? Yes and no. That was partially true. That was, that was today's trigger. But if it wasn't that, it would be some other reason. This is just today's attack, one link in an endless chain of attacks. And not the last one, by the way. It'll continue to happen. Hamas. Freedom fighters? Are they just a bunch of Hugo Chavez's that are wearing Arafat kafias? All they want to do is, you know... 
resist the occupation? The very first line on their charter that they penned in the 80s, Israel will exist until Islam obliterates it. What part of that do you not understand? I appreciate their honesty. I think it's very, I think it's very forthright. But they're just the latest chapter. They're just the latest inhabitant of this spirit. It is, if you take a look at the oldest hatred from Exodus 1, now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. And he said to his people, look, the people of, Ch the, the, people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them lest they multiply. From Pharaoh to Haman in the book of Esther, to Hitler, to Haman, or to uh, Hamas and Hezbollah. The, the, the spirit of Hitler and Hamas and Hezbollah are the same exact spirit. The only difference is, is that Hamas and Hezbollah are puppets of Iran. If they were a sock puppet, Iran's hand is the one that's inside. Nothing happened in Israel on October 7th that didn't get two thumbs up from Iran. Take a look at Psalm 83. If I told you that I was quoting an excerpt from something that the former president of Iran said, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, this sounds exactly like something that he would say. Come, let us destroy them as a nation so that Israel's name is remembered no more. That sounds pretty much like Israel should be blotted from the map. Israel should be erased from the pages of time. And here's a prayer. I don't know how many of you have ever gone to a Jewish home for Passover. If you ever have the opportunity, I highly encourage you to do it. Uh, brace yourself. It's going to start at about 4 p.m. It's going to wrap up about 1 a.m. And you're going to go, as I did the first time, with this somber great reverence for what it represents, the exodus out of Egypt. And then you're going to find out that it's like a, like a food fest party for kids. They're, you know, I was like, what, why do I have a bag of rubber frogs? Oh, we're going, to, we're going to throw them at each other in a little while. Really? Yeah, yeah, that's for the plague, the frogs. We're going to throw them at each other. And they do it because they make it so engaging for the kids that they can't wait for it next year. So they hang on every word so that they learn the story, so they know the story, so they can teach the story. And that's something that we could emulate. But here's a prayer that, they, that even in homes, even in Jewish homes, and I think Pastor Jason was just talking about it, even in these secular Jewish homes that don't, that, that don't identify as being a religious Jew or an observant Jew, I guarantee you that they still observe Passover because it's part of their identity and their tradition. And here's a prayer, and we're going to unpack this a little bit. And it is this covenant that has stood for our forefathers and us, for not just one enemy has stood against us to wipe us out, but in every generation there have been those who have stood against us to wipe us out, and the Holy One, blessed be He, saves us from their hands. And they'll say that prayer, and then they will usually kind of give a wink and a an nod, and they'll go, they tried to kill us, they failed, let's eat. And that's the chutzpah, that's the resilience. But let's, as a, as a Christian family, if you have kids, imagine that. How old is old enough to tell your child, oh, by the way, because your last name is Chatham, there's going to be people that want to kill you. How old is old enough to where when they finally grasp the reality of that, they're not going to wet the bed that night? Because that's a fear and a, and a legitimate concern that every Jewish family has to contend with. When are they old enough to know the reality that there will arise those that want to kill them just because of who they are, not because of what they did? We take a look at this image of the cemetery. 1,400 Israelis killed 80% of them were civilians, including Holocaust elderly, Holocaust surviving elderly, and infants and toddlers. I'm not going to elaborate. It's easy for you to find out the graphic, gruesome details of how some of these people lost their lives. Those are not forms of resistance. Take a look at these people just taking, they're seeing if the people that they can't track down were among the dead or if they were among the hostages. 
Right now, we're, our ministry, we're putting a lot of horsepower behind just keeping the hostages in the forefront. They seem to have been forgotten. I'm, I don't know, I'm not trying to color outside the lines or speak out of turn. Maybe it's just a coincidence and there's no connection at all, but when you give $6 billion to have six individuals released, kind of sends a message and an incentive. And remarkably, just a few days later, hostages were high on the to-do list. A pretty valuable commodity, apparently. And so I'm not pointing the finger at anybody, but I'm just saying that's something to be concerned. And as much as I love my country, I mean, I, my, my son is a Marine and my dad was a colonel in the Air Force. We always looked at the president, regardless of whether we're, there was an R or a D behind their name as the commander in chief. I'm just, I'm just wired up to be very patriotic and follow protocol. But if I was a hostage, I think I'd rather have Israel come and look to look for me. Yeah, on. One of the questions that you might not have asked yourself, but you probably, you might have asked yourself, but you probably wouldn't raise it if we had time for a Q&A. And that is, how are the Jewish community, how's the Jewish community processing this? They must have a serious ax to grind. Are they going into Gaza for vengeance? Are they, are they going in there to get even because of what happened? No, they're not going in there because of what happened. They're going in there to prevent it from ever happening again. They're not going in there to get even. They're going in there not because of what happened to those kids. They're going in there so it doesn't happen to their grandkids. It's not mowing the lawn. And, just, and though we're not going to get into the geopolitical nitty-gritty, the reality is, is that and as horrific as one death is, over 10,000 is 10,000 times worse in its horror. But the unvarnished truth is, is that every one of those deaths, their blood is on the hands of Hamas, not on Israel. Israel is doing what Israel has to do to go in there, and they've exceeded every human imaginable option to try to forewarn and and expedite and assist with evacuation, but Hamas is not letting those people evacuate. Half of the battle that they have in Gaza isn't trying to root out Hamas, they're trying to keep the corridors open so that Palestinians can evacuate. We won't get into those, but I want to get back to that question I just asked. How's the Jewish community processing this? What are they saying? How are they, are they praying, you know, for an eye for an eye? On October 8th, I started calling every Jewish Friend that I had, many rabbis, and I had a lot of calls to make, so I just put together a short script that was concise. You don't call up and go, hey, how you doing? I know how they're doing. So I just called them up, and as canned as it was for everyone, I just wanted to make get it across as fast as I could. I just want to let you to know that everyone at CUFI is heartbroken. We are outraged. And if there's anything that we can do to stand in solidarity with you, just let us know. And Rabbi Nancy started crying before I finished that, that sentence. And she said, we have a service on Shabbat this Friday that we're just calling a healing service because we're trying to figure out how to cope with this. Can you come? And I thought I was going to go to minister to them. And it turned out that they were ministering to me. This is the prayer that Rabbi Nancy led us in. She started it out with a quote that's attributed to Golda Meir. And now you gotta remember, this is Friday. They had just learned how toddlers had been killed. I'm not gonna say it here in the church, but you know what I'm referring to. They had just grasped that reality of learning how those toddlers had lost their life. And this is how they started out. We can forgive the Arabs for killing our children, but we can never forgive them for forcing us to kill their children. Let's use that as the baseline of their moral clarity. And this is the prayer that, that we were led in. We as a people, our children, our friends, have been called to do the unthinkable. In the name of freedom and security for the sake of the undying dream of peace, with hearts on the edge of breaking, our people have been called to kill and to be killed through the gruesome harshness of battle despite the soul-crushing savagery of war 
in the face of barbarism of almost unimaginable proportion, help us, Spirit of God, to soften our hearts, to safeguard our souls, to hold tight to our humanity and compassion. Just as you reminded us when we crossed the sea toward freedom that our enemies remain your children, remind us today and every day that death and devastation must never feed our souls, must always pain us to our very core. May we remember to cry for all victims of terror and hate in our land of Israel, in Gaza, and wherever they suffer and fall. May we remember that we do not seek vengeance and we do not revel in killing, but rather we grieve that we are called to destroy rather than create. I don't know how you can define moral clarity better than that. I'm going to ask you uh, in a second, if you were given one of these blue brochures, if you would pull the card out that's inside it. And I did forewarn Pastor Jason that I was going to give you a sneak peek of this. This is a small group study. It also doubles as a high school curriculum. And the reason I'm pointing it out right now, if in the event that you look at it as an optional small group study, or even if you just want to pick it up individually, this is a, an overview of Israel biblically, geopolitically, and historically. And if you go through all 20 chapters, it's going to culminate in chapter 20. And you're going to have the learning objective that, that reminds you, number one, being pro-Israel is never synonymous with being anti-Arab. God loves all of his kids. And the second learning objective is Matthew 5, 9. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they should be called the children of God. Every what, A few years ago, tonight we're going to be at Mount Calvary in West Valley. That's going to be much more geopolitical, much more edgy. It's a Spanish church, and it's translated. But the first time I was there 15 years ago, the, the, the head of the Jewish Federation, Eric, was there. And he got up without us even, he just got up, he said, can I say a few words? And he talked about how when he was just in elementary school, wearing a kippah, and he, and he was standing in the boys' bathroom, and he looked down and next to him on both sides were black boots with white laces in them, meaning skinhead. And he felt somebody grab his shoulder and pull him back, threw him on the floor, about ready to kick him with the steel-toed boots, and two other students pulled them off, intervened, and, and drug him out of the bathroom, two Christian students. And he told this story on how Christians stand. Pastor Jason told you about the three points and how going to Israel, how you can stand with Israel. You don't have to go to Israel to stand with Israel. There are Jewish people right here. I encourage you to look at opportunities to, to stand with Israel. Let's go to the, that image that you see with the, uh, let's go to the, oh, well, you're good. Let's go back to the protest image with the, with the flags. One of the, one of the sound bites that you're going to hear, if you, if you pull 10 of those protesters out and ask them why they're there, they're going to say, we're here because of the occupation. We're here because of the occupation. We're resisting the occupation. If you cannot dig anywhere in your land without unearthing evidence that your ancestors have been there for thousands of years, you're not occupying somebody else's land. You're in your ancient homeland. It's very important for us to remember that. Israel is truth. The people that are doing the protesting and then they call out for global jihad, kill Jews or anywhere in the world that you find them, that isn't resistance for occupation. That's anti-Semitism. And anti-Semitism, it's very important for us to realize, hatred of Jews is not the root of anti-Semitism. It is a byproduct of anti-Semitism. The root of anti-Semitism is rejection of God because they force people to consider God. So let's, uh, let's wrap up. I'm going to ask... Uh, Chris, if, if you don't mind, I'm just going to give you a very short overview video uh, just to give you a glimpse of this ministry. We started out in, fourth, in 2006 with 400 leaders. We're on the cusp of breaking 11 million. And uh, th I'm not bragging about that. I'm just saying that I'm not here to cast the vision about what we hope will come to fruition. This train has left the station. And if you want uh, a megaphone or a platform to give 
impact and oomph to your voice, we would be honored if you'd consider using us as a resource to do that. So Chris, if you want to run that clip, that'd be great. Let me begin by saying that you are a very special group of people. You are defenders of Zion, fulfilling the command given to all believers in every age and dispensation. There have been 10 pro-Israel actions in states across the country. Christians United for Israel was responsible for 75%. We led on 75% of those initiatives. We have advanced anti-BDS laws in Utah, in West Virginia, in Idaho. That's an organization we have worked with educators, with Department of Education to craft actual curricula, strategize with educators at the local level to say, how can we make this work into what you are already doing? It's one o'clock in the morning and I'm standing in Ben Yagirian Airport in Tel Aviv watching a miracle in process. A plane load of Ukraine Jews have just landed in the safe haven of Israel. Welcome to Jerusalem, the capital of Israel, and Kufai is back in Israel. Ultimately, when someone watches an episode of the Kufai Weekly, we want them to be informed, we want them to be educated, but we also want it to activate them into action. We thank you for friends of the Jewish people, friends of Israel, that have helped Israel and the Jewish people in such ways of magnitude that the tide of history will not wash them away, but they will be remembered eternally. We will continue to confront anti-Semitism in all of its forms, wherever it may be found. We are going to fight the good fight until the victory comes. We all know the truth. We know the real path to peace. We'll stay on that path. We'll encourage our leaders to do so. With all your help and prayers, I am confident the best is yet to come and it will be truly incredible. That was David Friedman, who was the former U.S. Ambassador to Israel. And if Ambassador Friedman was here right now, he would, and I'm not bragging because it's not bragging if it's true. If he was here right now, he would tell you that this ministry played a midwife catalytic role in getting the embassy moved from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. And and we are going to we're, we're going to continue to do that to strengthen the U.S. Israel relationship. Uh, I would encourage you to again in this blue brochure is a is our sign up card. Please fill out legibly. We would love for you to add your voice stars. And this is what that would be. Uh, it would it would be something that a dear precious friend of mine would love to see you do. And his name was Irving Roth. And he was a Holocaust survivor. He was liberated from Buchenwald after the death march from Auschwitz. And he spoke actually here in Salt Lake City a few years ago. If he was here, uh, he would tell you that whether it was an elementary school in Salt Lake City or whether it was all the way to the death camps of Poland, that when you have situations where people end up in a circumstance, there's ever only four kinds of people. In Auschwitz, it could be somebody that knocked on the door at one in the morning, and some Jewish people were let in to be hidden, even though the person that let them in knew that they could be killed. Their whole family would be killed if they got caught, but they let them in anyways. And that other door, you know, they let them in, and then they called the authorities and reported them, and off they went to Auschwitz. And you could go all the way down to the elementary school in Salt Lake where you've got a bully who maybe he was held back a year. He's got a little more heft. He's found out how easy it is to take lunch money away from the kids. And there's a little kid that says, I'm gonna tell the principal on you. And he knows that if he does, he's gonna get the snot beat out of him on the way home from school, but he does it anyways. So in anything between the shallow end of this spectrum and all the way to the extreme hell on earth of a death camp, there's ever only four kinds of people. There's the victim, the perpetrator, a bystander, and the intervener. And we're asking you to consider being an intervener. It could be as simple as taking three minutes to send an email that you want to see Utah advance Holocaust education. It could be as simple as making a phone call to make sure that your senators fund replenishment of Israel's Iron Dome defense system, whatever it is. Whatever it is, we would be honored to have our voice joined with yours and to lock arms with you. Thank you for letting me be a guest in this house today.